Greetings to you, family, on this second Sunday of Easter. Easter spans 50 days from Resurrection Sunday to Pentecost Sunday. And so as we continue to celebrate Resurrection, receive this text as our text of focus this morning, the Gospel according to John, chapter 20. I will begin reading at verse 19 from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. It reads um, as follows. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. And as the Father has sent me, I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book but these are written so that you may come to believe that jesus is the messiah the son of god and that through believing you may have life in his name this is the word of god for us the people of god thanks be to god let's pray gracious god meet us where we are from the many places where we are sitting now Enter in in a way that allows us to know you are with us and that you are amid us, but that you're also within us. Speak that we might hear both individually as your people, but also collectively as your body, that we are still the church, even though we cannot gather. Speak a word that will give us exactly what we need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Invitations of Resurrection. The invitations of resurrection. So the text of focus today recounts the first appearance of Jesus to the disciples after his resurrection. Now with the exception of Thomas and Judas of course, all of the other 12 um, of the 12 disciples are gathered together in a house behind locked doors and they are terrified that the leaders responsible for the death of Jesus will come and do them harm. Anybody willing to kill a person to stop their message, I would agree, are more than willing to do the same to that person's disciples. The disciples have undergone a very traumatic experience, y'all, in the trial and in the murder of their rabbi. And most of them had responded in a way that they weren't really proud of. But then there was more confusion after Mary Magdalene and the other women came and reported that Jesus, who was once dead, now lives. Two of the 12 disciples had actually gone to see the empty tomb, but had not had the ability or the opportunity to see the angel or to talk to Jesus as Mary had. And so they now fear for their lives when all they had done was follow a man who had healed people and fed people and raised people from the dead and calmed stores and preached love. Now I can understand why they're locked up in this place, why they are apprehensive and fearful, and yet they are together. And Jesus has said, where two or three, three gather in my name, I will be in their midst. And Jesus appears to them. Jesus greets them in the customary way. Peace be with you. 
He shows them the evidence of his crucifixion and they are overjoyed, believing this to be Jesus resurrected. Then Jesus says, just as my father sent me, I am sending you. And he breathed on them and he says to them, receive the Holy Spirit giving them power and authority and affirming the words he has spoken before. Anything you bind and loose on earth will be bound and loosed in heaven. But Thomas was not there. And when others, um, when the other disciples share with him this testimony that they had seen Jesus, his honest skepticism rises up. And Thomas says, unless I see it for myself and unless I can touch his body and know for myself, I cannot believe it. And in truth, if we're honest with ourselves, many of us need to experience Jesus for ourselves in order or need any kind of experience in order to really um, believe. The experiences of others may point us or the testimonies of others may help us to know what we're seeing when we see it. But our own experiences are often what convince us. And so a week after Jesus's first visit, the disciples are once again gathered in the same house with the doors shut. And now we um, must pause for a minute to say that how we perceive this moment in their life can be important, particularly for us as we're in the midst of shelter in orders of this pandemic. This can be interpreted um, regardless of whether or not the disciples are afraid of or not, we can see this as a reasonable precaution to protect life. So risking our physical safety for the sake of faith, for the sake of justice may be required at times, but this kind of risk isn't to be sought out or flaunted in a way that seeks to test whether or not God will protect us. We ourselves also have a call to protect life whenever possible. They are in a house, shut up in this house. And Jesus appears, greeting them again in this customary way. Peace be with you. And then he focuses his attention immediately on Thomas. To remove doubt, he says, look at my body and touch my side. Experience for yourself. And Thomas doesn't hesitate in accepting this invitation. He acknowledges Jesus as legit. And Jesus says to them, you have seen me and believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and still believe. Jesus then continues to fortify their faith with other signs not recorded here in this passage. But the text says that we have this account so that we might believe and have life in his name. So I want us to just spend a few moments talking about the invitations of the resurrection that I believe show up in this account. First, resurrection invites a visit from Jesus. It invites a visit from Jesus specifically into the places we have locked up. Resurrection is about death being transformed to life. The locked doors were in response to the fear and the pain the disciples had because of their interactions with people in the world and in the culture they lived in. Jesus bypasses their walls, bypasses their protective barriers, bypasses their locks, and comes right in to where they are. But notice he does not force them to do anything, nor does he scold them. His first offering to them is what? It's peace and then proof. And I believe this proof piece might actually point to something we don't often name. Now, there is no doubt that these disciples had experienced emotional trauma and were at th that particular moment still fearing the possibility of physical trauma. But consider, if you will, what else may very well have been going through their minds. They had left their families, their careers, their lives to follow this man named Jesus. He had taught them, showed them things they never thought possible. He had told them he would die and resurrect. But following the crucifixion and burial, it really looked like he had died just like anyone else. Consider what might run through your mind were you in their shoes. Were we hoodwinked? Did he lie to us? Was this betrayal? We choose to follow him and he's an imposter? Ooh, that creates shame. We gave up everything for him and left, and he left us. Feelings of abandonment. 
Well, in 2011, there was a televangelist, Harold Camping, who predicted that the world would end on May 21st, 2011 by worldwide earthquakes. Never mind that Jesus says in scripture that no one knows the day nor the hour, but people quit their jobs. They huddled in their homes awaiting this end. And when it didn't happen, he actually pushed the date to October. And when it didn't happen again, he finally gave up predicting. But imagine pouring your trust and your belief into a message and a messenger so much that you give up your life, sell or give up your possessions, quit your job only for the day predicted to arrive and what was predicted doesn't come true. The anger, the embarrassment, the fear of insecurity, betrayal, shame, abandonment. Now, I have to give a shout out to Sister Adrian, who introduced me to the work of Mario Martinez, who does a lot of um, neuro and psychological work with healing. And Dr. Martinez says that for every point of brokenness that we have or the main points of brokenness, there's a corresponding point of healing. So when we experience betrayal, the healing response is loyalty. For shame, the healing response is honor. And for abandonment, the healing response is commitment. If the disciples were also feeling amid these things, betrayal, shame, and abandonment, then Jesus' actions were first in order to heal. Jesus bypassing barriers and offering peace was a re-narrating of their perceived experience. I have not betrayed you. I am faithful and loyal. I have not abandoned you. I am committed to your well-being. Receive peace. But then Jesus calls them to purpose by proclaiming them still worthy of call. I am sending you as my father sent me, restoring honor where there may have been shame. Jesus visits first to care for them and then to call them back to purpose. But they had the option of responding in any way they wished. This was an invitation. We can expect a visit from Jesus wherever there is a need for resurrection. Second, resurrection invites honesty. Y'all naming stuff, it matters. Over the years, as I have coached others in overcoming fears, often, if not always, step one is to name the fear. Naming brings to consciousness and gives us permission or even frees us to have the power to act. This is why we name addiction. If it's hidden, we can't freely address it. For example, for some of us, myself included, we have put off pain that we feel in our bodies. And this is particularly so for people of color and even more so for women of color who, as we live in this particular um, society, our pain is dismissed and more so dismissed by doctors. But we put off going to the doctor, going to care for this thing, either out of not wanting to hear that it doesn't matter or fear of what it might mean or the dire circumstances that we might be in. But time after time, not pressing to find the culprit, culprit to not find the proper diagnosis, um, which will allow for the right treatment, the right response, results in greater suffering and even a greater um, loss, which could result in the loss of life. Naming stuff matters. But name also points to power. We call on the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. There was a belief, particularly in Old Testament times, that knowing someone's name invited intimacy. It meant being able to access their power. This is perhaps why Jacob insists on knowing the name of the mysterious being he wrestles with, whom he later names as God, but it may also be why that same being never really gives his name. And in Exodus, when Moses encounters God in the burning bush and asks for God's name, God says, the I am. This is important, the I am. God does not change, God is. Our circumstances change, what we learn or unlearn about God changes, but God does not change. Nothing we admit to God in honesty will change God nor God's love for us. In fact, God is, heart stop, love.
Now, to think that our honesty or being honest about what we're feeling, be it doubt, anger, fear, joy, whatever, will hinder God's love for us is the equivalent of believing or saying that we have the power to do something that changes the very essence of God, which is quite ludicrous when we hear it said out loud. Honesty with God while in pain is a reaching for faith we cannot feel but desperately want to and desperately need to. Jesus comes back to the house a week later, greets everyone, but then sets his focus on Thomas. Thomas, whose honesty has made it clear what he needs. I don't just need to see, but I need to touch. Thomas isn't scolded or berated, but is offered the same opportunity as his brothers. Jesus is faithful to all of us, not just some of us. Once Thomas can see that his worst fear had not come true, Jesus says, don't doubt, believe. Don't doubt your experiences with me. Don't doubt all of the things you've seen me do. I am real. But it is Thomas's honesty that makes space, y'all, for him to name and receive what he needs. And then Jesus affirms that honesty by providing for the need. Thomas's faith was dying, as in in the process of, but his honesty in naming it made room for it to come to life again. Resurrection invites honesty because honesty leads to life. The truth shall set us free. Third and finally, resurrection invites us to a path of peace. Peace counters fear and confusion their fear was understandable. It was based on the limitations of their understanding. What was real or what felt real was actually an illusion. In the classic Shakespeare tale of Romeo and Juliet, most of us know it, the two lovers go to extraordinary lengths to be together, to remain loyal to one another. Juliet fakes her death to be with the banished Romeo. But when Romeo hears of the death of Juliet and discovers her, he believes her to really be dead, not understanding what he's seeing. And he takes his own life only for Juliet to wake up and to do the same. Sometimes what appears true isn't. The disciples had every reason to be in fear and doubt. Jesus doesn't blame them for that, but Jesus does show up and invite them to see what they couldn't before and they accept the invitation. Now, if we're not careful, this can cause us to kind of be in perpetual doubt. This point is not intended to make us lose confidence, but rather to redirect our misplaced confidence. The realization that we may be limited in our understanding at any given time can push to the forefront just how much we lack control over many things but it is also the very thing that predicates the necessity of our faith. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Jesus says to disciples three times, y'all, three times, peace be with you. Yes, this is a customary greeting, but he says it twice in the first visit and again in the second visit, three times. Now the word with, W-I-T-H, literally means to accompany, but it also means possessed. Hear the blessing again. May peace possess you. May peace consume you. Jesus also says to the disciples, in essence, that they are given the power and authority to operate on his behalf. Jesus breathed on them. They have access through the Holy Spirit. Some theologians suggest that Jesus was breathing a part of himself into them, a part of his mind, his nature, his divine energy. This is very much connected to the anointing that we see in sending out. But I am suggesting that it's more than that. If we skip to what he says to them after Thomas touches him, we can hear it. You believe because you have seen, but blessed are those who believe 
without seeing. Notice Jesus doesn't say those who believe without seeing are better or right per se, but blessed. Blessed means sanctified and holy, but blessed also means content and happy, protected and guarded from evil. Those who can believe even when they cannot see faith will have access to the contentment that feeling protected provides. Faith is what secures us in an insecure world. Faith is how we make peace with what we can't control, how we make peace with what we cannot see. All three of these instances together, the speaking of peace into them, the breathing of divine energy onto them, and the proclamation of faith, believing without seeing, all point to the fact that this is about more than what we as disciples can do for God. This is also about the fact that God cares deeply about our quality of life. This is first about God's unrelenting love and grace for us. Then second, it is about our decision to accept the invitation to follow God's will and serve, which is about our love for God. Having to sacrifice and suffer at times may be part of our work, but it is undeniably a part of the life we live in this world. God offers us, through the perfecting of our faith, access to mental and emotional health while enduring. God cares about how we hold the burdens of this world and invites us to a path of being possessed, consumed by peace, even in the most unimaginable circumstances. Faith is the path to peace. Faith that Jesus is bypassing all the blockades the pain of this world has caused you to put up just to visit you. Faith that Jesus wants your honesty and will heal and reveal through it. Faith that peace is accessible. Faith that the Spirit of God is being breathed into you. Faith that life can come to the dying places of your soul and spirit even if you can't imagine it or see it. Peace is unleashed in us when we accept that the very thing, the very thing we can't fully understand, can't fully see, is the only thing that will save us, resurrection. In the name of life over death, amen and I share.